Prende ora la parola il presidente delle IOPA, Gabriel Bernardino. E IOPA's chairman, Gabriel Bernardino, has now the floor. Well, thank you very much and uh, first of all, good morning to, to all of you and uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be in Rome, of course, one of my preferred cities, definitely. And, uh, the, every time I come here, uh, it's fantastic. Uh, the, unfortunately, I don't have so much time to see, to see Rome, but it's always a pleasure just to view. So fantastic to be in here. And of course, also to have such a great audience in front of us, you know, uh, an important market in Europe. It's, uh, and with the implementation of Solvency II right now, it's quite a, an important point in time. So congratulations also to President Rossi for the, the, the initiative to have this conference uh, at this point in time. I think it's, it's very, very, very important and uh, quite timely, I would say. So it's, it's quite a pleasure for me, of course, to be in here today and to talk to tell you a little bit about uh, the past, the present, and, and the future, of course, and uh, bringing uh, you know, Solvency II to the context, of course, in which we are, but also um, looking at Solvency II as an opportunity. Uh, that's the way that uh, I, I also feel it. And in this sense, the title that uh, was chosen to the conference, um, I think it's particularly relevant for EOPA because the word launch of Solvency II, it's something that, of course, for us, it's very important. Uh, we have worked a lot together uh, with the stakeholders and uh, with political decisions during many years to put Solvency II in place. And now we are starting another journey, and that's what I want also to talk to you a little bit uh, today. So explaining what's the EOPA's role in this new journey that we have uh, of implementation of Solvency II. I will then focus on some important challenges related to implementation of uh, the new risk-based regime and what should be done, in my view, to make sure that um, by implementing Solvency II, we deliver the objectives that we had uh, at the beginning of this project. And finally, I will share my views on the, on the post-evaluation process uh, that we are now starting and that will guide us to, of course, the, the, re the review of Solvency II. The first regulatory journey of EOPA was completed in 2015. So on 1st of January this year, a new, and I will say even more challenging and more important supervisory journey began. So Solvency II is definitely an opportunity, an opportunity to have a much more convergent supervision in Europe. This is EOPA's mission. And I'm confident that our unique position as a European authority, working together with the national competent authorities in the different member states, will allow us to provide a very good level of consistency of supervisory approaches and practices. And in this sense, I would really would like to thank IVAS Italian colleagues, Alberto Corinti, Fausto, and uh, the staff of uh, IVAS that is engaging in, I would say, a very fantastic cooperative uh, mindset uh, with EOPA, always with, um, of course, some national issues as everybody has in Europe, but with, with a European mindset. And that I think it's fundamental and very important. I really want to thank all the cooperation and constructive approach that the colleagues of IVAS have had to, to EOPA in this, all these years. So at EOPA, we have been preparing for this journey already in the past years, from regulation to supervision, as we used to say it. And let me, let me start by asking one simple question. Why is supervisory convergence so important? Because, in my view, it is essential in order to achieve three fundamental objectives. The first one, to ensure that European Union regulation is applied in all member states. Secondly, to guarantee a level playing field and to prevent regulatory arbitrages in the internal market. And thirdly, to safeguard a similar level of protection to all policyholders and beneficiaries in the European Union. So it's because of these three main objectives that we need definitely to pursue supervisory convergence. Given the current differences of supervisory cultures and practices between member states, I appreciate that our new journey might turn into an odyssey. But it's the right odyssey for us to be undertaking. The European Union has to have a common supervisory culture, and that is precisely why EOPA and the European System of Financial Supervision was created. 
we are decisive and fully committed to enter this new journey for the sake of a more coordinated and robust financial supervision in Europe. In the coming years, our main priority will be to increase convergence towards a European supervisory culture, a risk-based culture that will aim to ensure strong but fair supervision, that will be based on a forward-looking approach to risks, taking into account one fundamental point that I think we all need to learn after the crisis that we have passed. Prevention is always better than repair. And so financial supervision needs to be forward-looking and preventive. A culture that prioritizes the dialogue with market participants in order to better understand the business models, the strategies, and the underlying risks. Again, the preventive element. A culture that promotes early enough awareness and supervisory actions in order to protect policyholders and to mitigate possible disruptions in the market. These are fundamental elements of a European supervisory culture that we are building in. So how exactly is AOPA building this common supervisory culture? Let me mention a number of examples. Firstly, HELP is building a comprehensive information system based on the data collected under the new harmonized Solvency II reporting templates. With this system, the insurance supervision in the EU will have a new important asset. It will further develop the capacity to provide reliable risk analysis and early warning indicators, both at individual, group, and system-wide level. It will improve the supervisory understanding of cross-border groups. It will provide the national authorities with peer comparisons, increasing supervisory capability at the local level. In one word, this will reinforce the quality of both micro and macro supervision in the European Union. Secondly, HEOPA is developing on a step-by-step -step basis a supervisory handbook, setting out good risk-based supervisory practices in the different areas of Solvency II. We have already covered areas like risk assessments, how to supervise board responsibility, business model analysis, supervision of technical provisions, monitoring of internal models. All of these are aspects very concrete of the implementation of the regime where we are building good practices. And of course, we encourage all the national authorities to implement these good practices in their supervisory processes. Thirdly, a special attention is of course devoted to the ongoing monitoring of internal models, an area where material differences can have a huge impact in the level playing field and in policyholder protection. EOPA already issued in 2015 a couple of supervisory opinions with recommended practices to national authorities, and this work will continue this year by prioritizing areas where different approaches may lead to material impact. Going forward, we will focus on the development and testing of sound ongoing appropriateness indicators and benchmarking for internal models. This work will be fundamental to ensure that internal models will continue to fulfill the required standards and avoid that they become just a capital optimization tool. A race to the bottom will kill the underlying idea of an internal model. And this is something that we have been learning also from the banking side. Of course, we have done much more over the past two years that were years of preparation for Solvency II. We delivered the Solvency II implementing technical standards and guidelines. Some guidelines concern the basic alignment of supervisory processes, while others provide clarity to firms on what are supervisors' expectations. I'm really convinced that without the guidelines, undertakings would have faced hundreds of pages of different national solutions, and it would have been much more complicated to achieve convergence. Also, we have worked on colleges of supervisors across the EU, and these have been a fundamental tool to increase the exchange of information and to move towards a more common analysis and measurement of risks. As of January this year, we are publishing on a monthly basis the risk-free interest rate term structures to be applied by all insurance and reinsurance companies in the calculation of technical provisions. 
The use of harmonized discount rates will ensure a more consistent calculation by insurers throughout the European Union. Going forward, peer reviews will continue to be used to compare and assess the quality of implementation of Solvency II and the corresponding supervisory practices, followed, of course, by concrete recommendations to address the issues identified. Furthermore, AOPA's oversight team will continue the bilateral engagement with national authorities, providing independent and challenging feedback on supervisory practices, facilitating cross-border discussions and supporting improvements in local supervision. In this context, last year, we made a balance sheet review in cooperation with the local supervisors in Romania, and this proved to be essential to increase the credibility and enhance consumer protection and confidence in that market. A similar exercise is currently being organized in Bulgaria. So our oversight work is already starting to prove its vital importance in ensuring strong but fair supervision and a forward-looking approach to risks. Let me now turn to three main challenges related to Solvency II implementation and the expectations, of course, from our side. And I will try to you know, focus on areas um, in the pillar two and the pillar three. I think it's also the conference today focus on that. There's too much, I would say, talk on capital. Let's try to focus on other areas. And I choose three areas which I think are particularly important. The first one, the governance, the governance requirements and the use of the, the ORSA, the Own Risk and Solvency Assessment. The second one, the Solvency to Public Disclosures. And finally, the governance attitude of companies and the creation of a more consumer-centric culture. As you know, a crucial element in Solvency II is the new risk management requirements, and in particular, the ORSA. Insurance undertakings should make full use of the ORSA to set up a strong risk culture. This is the cultural change that President Rossi was referring to, and it's needed, definitely. Insurers should increasingly use robust risk management capabilities to deal with the different challenges posed by the economic slowdown, the low interest rate environment, financial market volatility, all these elements that we know that we have out there. And by the way, I think that if we look at the situation today, I think that the insurance sector has been benefiting a lot from all these that have been done in Solvency II, especially in this area of Pillar II in risk management because they are much better prepared right now to deal with all this environment that we have nowadays, because we have done all this work together during these many years on the, on the governance and risk management side. But let me have a very concrete message on this. You know, the time of box ticking, it's over. Risk management requirements, and specifically the ORSA, cannot be taken as a compliance exercise. And that is the fundamental element in here. And this requires a clear tone from the top, from many of you around in this, in this audience. We expect boards of insurance companies to set, communicate, and enforce a risk culture that consistently influences, directs, and aligns with the strategy and the objectives of the business, and thereby supports the embedding of a risk management framework. Supervisors will need to be very attentive to this. Because we can only get the benefits of all this governance and risk management system of Solvency II if we go beyond compliance. Second challenge, the public disclosure. One of the cornerstones of the new regime is transparency. We know it since the beginning. With Solvency II, undertakings need to publicly disclose essential information on their solvency and financial condition. Let's be honest. For most part of the European insurance and reinsurance market, this is a novelty and a paradigm shift in terms of communication with the outside world. In my view, this should be used as an opportunity, an opportunity to address stakeholders' perception on perceived opaqueness and inadequacy of publicly disclosed information. We encourage insurance and reinsurance undertakings to embrace this opportunity and to actively engage in consistent, comparable, and high-quality communication 
with their stakeholders on their solvency and financial condition. And of course, from our side, we'll be very attentive to what will be the quality and the consistency of disclosures in these first years. But here I would also like to highlight the importance of a good understanding of the solvency to disclosures by those who shape the public and market opinion about companies, financial analysts, researchers, journalists. A collective effort is needed to ensure that the solvency to metrics and their sensitivities are properly understood, in particular because they will be definitely more volatile than in the past. And that is something that collectively we need to understand in order not to penalize a sector for being more transparent. And that I think it's very much important and from AOPA side we will be very keen and very committed also on engaging uh, uh, with financial analysts, researchers, the public at large to understand better the metrics of Solvency II. Third and final challenge, to create a consumer-centric culture. The new governance requirements of Solvency II should be used as a paradigm shift towards a more consumer-centric culture. There is a need to better integrate conduct of business concerns in the institutional governance arrangement in order to ensure that companies reliably place the interests of their customers at the heart of their business. And it's not only about designing and putting in practice appropriate governance structures and controls. It is now time to ensure that they are effective and that they deliver the desired outcomes. We do not want to move to a culture of formal compliance with rules. Rather, we all need to promote a culture based on strong ethical values. When putting in practice the fundamental sound governance basis of Solvency II, special attention should be devoted to companies' processes related to the manufacturing and the distribution of products. When designing products, insurers have to identify the target markets for the products, analyze its characteristics, and ensure that the product meets the identified objectives and the interests of that market. The distribution channel selected should also have the appropriate for the target market, and the clear, accurate, and update information has to be disclosed, both to distributors and, of course, to consumers. In effect, companies need to establish processes so that they and their senior management and boards can take more responsibility for ensuring that the products are only sold to those that are designed for. Consumers need to be placed at the heart of companies' businesses. And let me be very clear, this is good for consumers, but this is also good for business. That's the message I think that's more important. Looking forward, now that Solvency II is in place, we need, in my opinion, definitely a period of stability of the regulatory framework. But of course, financial regulation and supervision cannot exist independently from economic reality. A sound process of post-evaluation of the new regime is an integral part of good regulation. Therefore, the foreseen review is a logical and reasonable way forward. And at AOPA, we are already preparing the relevant project plans in order to ensure that we will do a rigorous, evidence-based, and transparent review of the framework. Our work will assess possible cumulative effects and unintended consequences. We will privilege principles like simplicity and proportionality, and a special attention will be given to procyclicality, to effects on investment behavior and product availability to consumers. From this year till 2020, AOPA will perform on a yearly basis, an assessment of the implementation of the long-term guarantee measures. By 2018, we need to revisit the calibration of the different asset classes under Solvency II, and in my opinion, this should also include, include the treatment of sovereign bonds. The recent financial crisis has demonstrated to all of us that sovereign bonds are not always risk-free. So a risk-based regulatory framework should take this into account. In April last year, we issued an opinion on the preparation for internal model applications, recommending that risks related to sovereign exposure should be appropriately taken into account in internal models. Going forward, we are going to monitor the way that this was implemented in the insurance market in the EU. 
but the subject of a possible consideration of sovereign risk in the Pillar 1 standard formula is definitely a more complex one. In my opinion, to avoid regulatory arbitrage, it is particularly important that we work on an approach towards sovereign risk that is consistent for the entire financial sector covering banking and insurance. Moreover, from a prudential perspective, I believe that the regulatory treatment should focus on building appropriate incentives to avoid excessive concentrations on a specific sovereign. This work should be part of a comprehensive process that should include public consultations, rigorous impact assessments, and the definition of appropriate transition measures to avoid unintended consequences. Furthermore, the future review of Solvency II should also benefit from the progress achieved at the international level. EOPA will continue to give the European Union a strong voice in international fora and will further strengthen its successful participation in the development of the international capital standards. In conclusion, Solvency II represents an enormous opportunity to improve risk management, embed a risk culture in the organizations, and develop sustainable business models, putting customers at the center of the undertaking strategies. It also creates an opportunity to improve the functioning of the internal market, in particular by ensuring a high, effective, and consistent level of supervision, preventing arbitrage, guaranteeing a level playing field, and ensuring a similar level of protection for all policyholders. I'm definitely confident that if both insurance market and supervisors remain faithful to the sound basic principles of Solvency II framework, the results for enhanced consumer protection and financial stability will be very positive. Just to finalize, I would like to rephrase Julius Caesar, who said that it is easier to find men who will volunteer to die than to find those who are willing to endure pain with patience. Well, we all need to become a legion of those rare men that stand ready to endure the pain of learning and reforming our financial system with patience. Trust me, the reward will be big. We are giving the chance to create the basis for a more stable future for the next generations of European Union citizens. If we proceed with the spirit of working together, learning from each other and listen to each other, in the end we will all become the winners of this battle. And fortune favors the brave. Thank you very much.